today on the Film and Whiskey Podcast, we will be scoring out our most recent director, Catherine Bigelow. Then we'll be trying two American whiskeys from wildly different places. This is the Film Film and Whiskey Whiskey Podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome into the Film and Whiskey Podcast. I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And today we are coming at you with another special bonus episode. Mm, Bonus episode. We have finished out another director, Brad, in our season O directors. And that means it's time for us to (laughs) apply this director to our uh, tried and true metric of how good or bad are you as a director. (laughs) <laughs> and let me tell you what, Bob, this is the first time we've ever scored out a female director, so I feel like we're in dangerous territory. We sure are. The entire burden of female directors rests on the shoulders of Catherine Bigelow. And Brad, we're going to be measuring three films by Catherine Bigelow, The Hurt Locker, Zero Dark Thirty, and Point Break on our five-point metric. Brad, can you break down like the impetus behind this whole metric thing that we do? Uh, I made it up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that it, it it kind of came out of the the scoring of whiskeys, but there is I don't know, man. There's just something fun about tinkering around with scores mm. and and trying to say, hey, like. As a director, how good is this person at directing actors? How good are they at editing? How good are they at, like, bringing about unique ideas in the world of cinema? Mm. And I I think that it's fun. And if I'm being honest, I feel like our scores are beginning to take shape. Now that we've done it for an entire season's worth of directors last season, Mm -hmm. and if you missed that, go join our Patreon and you can get access to all of those. But, I mean, at this point, we're probably on our 10th to 12th director. Yeah, at least. And it, it takes a little bit of time to build the body of work of of scoring. And here we are. I feel pretty confident in in where we are scoring our directors at this point. Yeah, absolutely. And just, you know, a brief history of why, not why we do this, but how we did this. We had a bonus episode last season, and we kind of talked about what are the major categories that if you were going to determine what a good director should be good at? What would you call those categories? And we kind of came down on five categories, the first of which is performances. So like Brad said, how good is this person at directing their actors? What kind of performances uh, is he or she getting out of the performers? Uh, Cinematography, how do the movies look? I mean, you know, I'm not saying that every director has to have Lawrence of Arabia type cinematography, but you got to know how to use the camera a little bit or it's going to count against you. The third category is editing. This is where we consider, you know, basically, how does the movie look? How does the movie sound? How does the movie flow? This is where we really get into the rhythm of the movie. I think some directors, Brad, are just known for being a little bit too self-indulgent, and their movies' runtimes reflect that. You can have a long movie that's still paced really well. You can have a short movie that's paced awfully. And I think that's the place where we would kind of ding a director for that. The fourth category we call cohesion. Does everything hold together? Does everything make sense? What kind of world is the director creating? And then finally, uniqueness. And this is where we measure the director against his or her peers. Do they have a unique and singular voice in cinema? And so it's time for us, Brad, to put Catherine Bigelow through the ringer here. And again, we're only judging her on the three films that we watched this season. So let's go ahead and jump in with performances. What did you think of her ability to get good, bad, medium level performances? Uh, I I mean, I think in the three films we watched, Hurt Locker, Zero Dark Thirty, and Point Break, I'm I'm struggling with the performance of Patrick Swayze, and and not in the sense that it wasn't good. We, We both agreed he was incredible in that film. Do you think that was Bigelow directing him? Or Patrick Swayze just being Patrick Swayze? Mm, 
I think that was the sways through and through, man. That like that's kind of what I think. Like I, I don't know if I'm discounting her as a as a younger director at that point, but I, I you know, I will give her credit. She directed, and that's the por- performance we got. But you know, Patrick Swayze was just going going full sways on us, and it was incredible. <laughs> But I, I think when you go to the two modern films, I think you have some really solid, like, B-plus performances out of almost every single actor we see on screen. Mm-hmm. Now, it may not be entirely fair for me to be doing this, Brad, but I have a, a nice little spreadsheet in front of me where I keep score of all these director metrics we're doing. And the other two directors we've done so far this season were, in order, Clint Eastwood and Billy Wilder. And in the performances category, we gave Eastwood a 7 because there are some actively bad performances in those movies that we watched from him, especially Gran Torino. In Billy Wilder's movies, we really liked most of the performances. We gave him a 9 out of 10. I think Bigelow, frankly, didn't have any performances in any of these movies that I thought were nearly as bad as some of the untrained actors in Eastwood's movies. But I don't think any of them really hit the heights of some of the better performances in Wilder's movies either. And so I really feel like I'm just going to split the difference here and give her an 8 out of 10. Dude, I am in the exact same spot. I, I think that the performances are solid. Serviceable. Great. Yeah. Yeah, serviceable. Really, like, really solid. Jeremy Renner was pretty good. I liked uh, Anthony Mackie. Yeah, he uh, was a great. More in he that was great. Film. Yep. Uh, you know, Jessica Chastain gives a good performance. So yeah, overall, I I think eight out of 10 is fair. All right. The second category is cinematography. And this is an interesting one because Zero Dark Thirty and The Hurt Locker have such similar cinematography. It's that late, you know, aughts shaky cam that we Mm -hmm. know and love. And then you get Point Break, which very much looks and feels like a 90s action movie. And they are very, very different. And yet I don't think that, hmm, how do I want to say this, Brad? I don't think the cinematography takes away from the movie in any of these three instances. I can't say that it's necessarily a strength of any of these movies either, even though I know some people like to talk about the Hurt Locker's cinematography. I thought that Zero Dark Thirty had some really great moments of framing, especially. And you can see that that movie had a, a much larger budget than the Hurt Locker did. But again, I think the cinematography helps tell the story and doesn't get in the way of things more than it's a point of like, we're going to hang our hat on how good this movie looks. So I think I'll I'll give her an eight out of 10 again. You know, eh, I'll say this. I'll give her a seven and a half because it's like serviceable. It serves the plot and that's all it needs to be. Bob, I I worry that these episodes are going to get a little boring because I I I don't have anything else to say. I'm with you. She's good here, not great. Similar to her performances, I was at an eight out of ten, the same as before. All right. Well, why don't you take us into editing then, so I can stop yammering on for a little bit. (laughs) Honest, if I'm being honest, I think editing is probably her strongest suit. I think that both the modern films and Point Break move at just such a nice pace. You know, the if there's one place to knock, it would be Zero Dark Thirty. I think that film runs about 20 to 25 minutes too long. Mm. But other than that, I think that the Hurt Locker is the right length. Every scene takes about the right amount of time. I think that Point Break has a really fast, fun pace about it so i you know overall and and as we're going through this we have to remember that editing also includes the musical score so as you think about these three films bob i i guess i would say that the the music doesn't stand out for any Mm -hmm. of them but it doesn't detract from any of them either yeah and and also we're not necessarily just talking about the score but also the entire sound design of the movie and i think that that's a point of Strong emphasis with Catherine Bigelow. Uh, the Hurt Locker is especially really, really good at this in some of those tense, you know, uh, diffusing of the bomb scenes. Zero Dark Thirty does a good job. Point Break is an early 90s movie, and it has these, like, weird early 90s sound effects in some spots. And that's just, you know, it is what it is. Brad, I'm kind of conflicted on the editing score here because – a lot of times we try to walk the fine line between, like, what should be counted in editing and what should be counted in cohesion – I think I'm going to score her really high in the cohesion, the cohesiveness of these movies. 
But in editing, there were actually some moments, you know, Zero Dark Thirty is way too long. And then in Point Break, the very first scene at the beginning of the movie where they're introducing the robbery, um, it's edited in such a way that it's like it's completely incoherent. It's it's too fast paced. You don't get a sense of the interior of that bank. And I think there's a few moments across Point Break where it just kind of seems like, it, you know, it's almost like a Michael Bay movie, the way that they cut every second before you really get your bearings. So mm. I'm going to reward it because the Hurt Locker is almost a perfectly edited movie. But then the other two definitely had some flaws. I think I'll give her an eight and a half in editing. The, this for me was her her strongest uh, category. I give her a nine out of ten here because I'm with you. I think that the Hurt Locker is an impressive example of how to edit a, a very tense war movie. And the other two are really solid in the category. So so nine out of ten here for me. Uh, I don't know. You you start us off in cohesion here, Bob, because you seem to think that this is where she's at, at her best. You know, I don't think I'd ever actually phrased it this way before today, but I think thinking about world building is a really good way to think about the cohesion category. Like, does the movie hang together is a kind of nebulous question, because I think that's like a, a way of asking, does it just work for you or does it not work for you? And I think a better way of phrasing it is like, has the director done a good job of building out the world of this movie? Not that it needs to be some sort of like high fantasy Tolkien-esque epic, but like, you know, does Point Break hold together? And honestly, as 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 goofy and dumb as that movie is, I think she does a really great job of creating this completely insane fictional counterculture surfer Robin Hood world. And it totally works for what she's trying to do. And I think that cohesion is definitely the strongest suit with Bigelow because the world of the Hurt Locker, you know, you and I talked about some of the logical inconsistencies in that movie. But I think that mm -hmm. for what she's trying to craft and that that paranoia and that feeling that war is a drug, the cohesiveness of that movie is pretty stellar. And I would say the same for Zero Dark Thirty. So I'm actually going to give her the nine and a half that you gave it in editing. I'm going to give it to her here in cohesion. Yeah, I, I think that cohesion is solid, but not gr – well, I would say it's solid. I, I, I'm going to give her an eight and a half here. I think that the world of Zero Dark Thirty makes the most sense to me, the the CIA realm that Chastain is working within. Mm -hmm. I, I think that there's too many things that kind of fall apart in Hurt Locker of him just randomly leaving the base and – and the way he gets away with stuff just wouldn't really happen in, in the army from from what I have heard from a lot of my army friends. So mm -hmm. so that one kind of falls apart for me a little bit. I'm with you, though, on point break. Like when you take away the realism of the the two later movies and just let them be like, hey, this is the FBI in California and this is how we roll. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I, I can get down with that and the, the world building that she goes on. So so eight and a half here. All right. And then our last category is uniqueness. And this is, I think, if any area of this metric is going to be kind of a minefield for us to navigate, Brad, it's this one, because by virtue of her being our first female director and being one of only three female directors to ever win the Oscar for best director, and she was the first one to do it, she is unique, right? She has a singular voice in Hollywood. I think aesthetically, artistically, there's not a lot that is singular about the way she makes movies. Do you know what I mean? And I would even yep. say, if we're talking about the three women directors who have won Oscars, her movies are probably the least artistically unique. I kept comparing her to Ridley Scott. I still think that's a pretty good comparison or I wouldn't have made it. Um However, like <laughs> Bob standing on his laurels, <laughs> you know, I was reading a really good book about it was about women directors. And Catherine Bigelow was such a point of interest in this book because she has so often actively said, like, I am not trying to bring a woman's perspective to these movies. I'm just making the movies that need to be made. And by virtue of me being a woman, like it's a woman movie, like I'm not trying to force some lens upon this movie. And the book was really interesting in talking about how a lot of people say that she is anti-feminist, but then to impose some 
set of rules that you think a female director should be bringing to a movie is kind of anti-feminist in itself. So what do we do with <laughs> Catherine Bigelow? And and that's where I think you just kind of have to come back to what's on screen mm-hmm. and how unique is it visually, you know, uh, cohesive, like, cohesively even a word, like artistically. And I think it's just not really there the way it is with some of the other directors we've looked at. I'll give her a seven and a half because I think that she's a really great director. I just don't know that there are a lot of hallmarks of her style that you can hang on to and say, yes, this is a uniquely Catherine Bigelow thing. Yeah, this is where I'm going to ding her the most. Uh, I, You said everything perfectly, Bob. I, I think that we get so caught up in the intersectionality of it all where like yeah she's a female and she won the first uh oscar for best director as a female and and that's a huge accomplishment that's really really cool and honestly it's for a movie that deserved it that year like i I think that between that and up in the air like they're both really solid movies that year so sure i'm i'm glad that she won it you're forgetting avatar the, I, the the clear and deserving winner of the 2009 Oscar. Am I right? Yeah. Uh, yep. Sure. <laughs> sure thing, Bob. That good old Avatar. You know. But but Jimmy Cam. Jimmy C. Uh, I I will say I'm glad that that Hurt Locker won over that. Yeah. Me too. Least. Me too. Hundred <laughs> percent. But I I think what I'm trying to say is when you just look at the product on screen, as you said, Bob, it's not the most unique. Is it well made? Yep. Are there great performances? Yep. Is the sound design incredibly well done, especially in the Hurt Locker? Heck yeah. But it's not the most unique. So I'll give her a 7 out of 10 here. All right, Brad, that is bringing me to a 41 out of 50 on our metric. What are you coming out to? A 40.5. All right. So that's taken us to a 40.75 out of 50. Again, guys, she is like a a well above average director. That's kind of doesn't even need to be said. She's won an Oscar. Like you don't typically win best director if you're not good at directing with maybe a few notable exceptions, you know, (laughs) one or two, the the lowercase O Oscar. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So that was Catherine Bigelow. We would love to know what you think about Catherine Bigelow, which of the three movies that we did was your favorite, which is the one that you think she should be remembered by. You can always find us to let us know on our social media accounts, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, at Film Whiskey. Brad, we've got two whiskeys to check out before we get out of here today. So what do you say we try this Westland whiskey and Whiskey Gypsy? Mm, Let's get to it, man. I'm excited for this peated American whiskey. Mm. All right, our first whiskey of the day is from Westland Whiskey. We have tried Westland before on the podcast. You may remember a few seasons back. They are back with a new range of whiskeys that they're calling the Outpost Range. And the first one among them, they're calling Solum. S-O-L-U-M. Solum. Solum. This is an American single malt whiskey, as are all of their whiskeys. But this is the first one that's come out of their distillery to be a peated whiskey. They say Mm. that they've been experimenting with peat for a long time, but this is the first one that's actually made it to shelves and apparently to our glasses as well, Brad. This is a single malt American whiskey, which is aged in new American oak casks and then finished in ex-bourbon casks. It says that there is a minimum maturation time of 41 months. So the youngest whiskey in here is about three and a half years old. And the ABV on this is 50%. So we're drinking 100 proof for today. Yeah, we sure are. And I honestly, I really enjoy seeing peated whiskeys at a little bit higher of proof sometimes. Mm-hmm. Like I, I, I love me some 86, 82 proof, you know, single malts. They they can really hit the spot and have so much flavor. But every once in a while, it's nice to have the option to water it down yourself. Brad, I just poured this out into my glass. And I think the thing that's most surprising to me about this is how bright and sweet it is on the nose. It smells to me like um, like strawberry glaze. Like it's really, yep. really berry forward. And mm-hmm. I don't think I've ever gotten that on a peated whiskey before. Yeah, no, that's, I, I wrote down crisp apple. There's some honey, there's some citrus. Uh, it gets a little bit, uh, almost thyme, like kind of mm. a, a seasoning-ish feel to it. Mm-hmm. 
But all that being pushed to the side for the fact that, yeah, there's raspberry, there's blueberry, and it, it has a little bit of sugariness to it that reminds me of like, I don't know, almost like my wife's like blueberry cobbler or something. Yeah. Like, like, but if you got a bite mostly of the blueberries and just a tiny bit of the the cake. You know, I, I know that most people, peated whiskey is like the final frontier for them. And they really hold off on trying it because it's just, <laughs> it doesn't sound that appetizing. You know what I mean? I feel like, like you should play the Jurassic Park theme song in the background. <laughs> The final frontier. I guess what I want to say is this. This is the most appetizing that I've ever had a peated whiskey smell. It is very inviting. And that peat smoke really accentuates those berry notes really, really well. I'm excited to dive into this, man. Yeah, I I obviously already have. Uh, As I said, there is a lot of, of complexity on the nose uh, as we got into the palate, that continued. Oh, for, this for is me, good. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I couldn't yeah, wait for... anymore, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. For me, this was very herbaceous. Mm-hmm. There, there was a lot of really, really cool, uh, almost like an herb garden notes going on here. There was some pine needle. Yep. It it felt like a really dark honey, like not like a really light, bright honey, but like a dark, more aged honey. It's a little bit smoky, and the oak comes through in just a little bit of a a seasoning way that kind of allows it to give some some maturity there. Bob, this is a damn good whiskey. Bro, this is like... 45 out of 50 type whiskey right now. This is stellar. I don't know what to say. I'm so caught off guard by this. (laughs) It has that note that I get on craft whiskey a lot, which is it's not just herbal, but it almost has that. It it goes beyond pine needle into that kind of like the smell you get on your hands when you're cutting weeds, like really woody weeds out out of like an overgrown area of your yard or something like that. It has that note on it, but then it's rounded out by really sweet apple and berry, and then that really pleasant kind of subtle peat. Like, this is the perfect amount of peat to complement the flavor profile of this whiskey. While you were talking, Brad, I I looked up the price on this that it's retailing for, and it looks like direct from Westland, it's selling for $145. This is an expensive whiskey. I almost don't have any hesitation in still recommending it. Like, I don't think that I would give it a 10 out of 10 on value, but this is one of the best peated whiskeys I've ever had. And so if we're just going on that, and especially from the American side of things, I don't know if we've ever had maybe one or two other American single malts that are peated. And if we have, I don't really remember them because this thing just blows everything else out of the water. Yeah, Bob, this Westland Outpost range is truly one of the best peated whiskeys I've had, and it's because they don't dive too deeply into the realm of the peat. They keep it back just enough that it truly enhances the flavor on everything happening around it. Mm -hmm. There, There is just enough smoke that it gives it this savory, charcuterie feel But you don't lose sight of all the berry, all the honey, all of the the herbs that are going on here. So this whiskey is called Solum. Once again, that's the name of this expression. It was just voted as the best American single malt by the World Whiskeys Awards. And I got to say, I can't disagree. Like, this is just fantastic. And that means that uh, our next whiskey on the docket has a lot to live up to, Brad, because this is a tough act to follow. We're going to be looking at Whiskey Gypsy. This is called uh, Legacy Volume 1, colon, The Journey. That's the name of this expression. Whiskey Gypsy is a new venture from country music star Eric Church. He has started up a new spirits brand. Yeah, they're sourcing this whiskey. It's a blend of different kinds of whiskey. The first of which is a 70% corn bourbon, which has been aged seven and eight years from Indiana. 21% of this blend is Canadian rye whiskey, which has been aged for 20 years. And then the remaining 9% is American single malt, which was aged for four years. So the youngest whiskey in here is four years. The oldest whiskey in this blend is 20 years old. I'm excited to see what notes come out on this, Brad, because it's mostly bourbon, but with some really well-aged rye in here as well. 
Uh, I know mm-hmm. you've tried this before. I have not tried it yet. I'm just pouring it out. Why don't you give us your nosing notes? Yeah, the the nose here, there, there's a lot of ethanol coming right at the front. It, it's very alcohol forward. Once you sit with it for a little bit, I got some cherry cordial, some sweet corn, caramel, vanilla, a, a lot of really nice bourbony notes, but not with a lot of complexity or depth to to underlay them. I, I don't know about you, Bob, but I, I, I thought that the nose was solid, decent. Yeah, this is pretty subtle, Brad. There, there's a little bit of astringency on this. Like I'm getting like the faintest wisp of almost like nail polish remover on this. But underneath that, there's uh, that kind of like medicinal bubblegum scent. You know, like when you were a kid and they gave you that bubblegum flavored <laughs> medicine. I get that a little bit. It's really mm-hmm. waxy. And I think that's kind of why it's hard to to find really prominent notes on this. Definitely a more subtle scent than the last whiskey we just had. But I don't think it's bad. Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a solid experience. There's just something missing and and i feel like it's a little too potent i i feel like the alcohol hits real hard on the nose and kind of prevents you from getting some of that complexity yeah and i would say that carry that carries forward into the flavor as well this is a lot more like immediately sweet on the palate than that peated whiskey was that we just tried it's also much more prickly and it's also a much thinner mouthfeel which i wasn't expecting with a 20-year whiskey blended into it. Yeah, Brad, if I'm being honest about this one, I think that it definitely stays in that kind of alcohol-forward range. It's not an astringent taste, but there's just not a lot of depth or complexity here for me. Yeah, and that, I, I hate to say it, man. I'm, I'm struggling a little bit. And to be clear, like, I drank these whiskeys pretty far apart. Like, I, I drank the Westland one day, I drank the Gypsy the next day. So... There's no hangover from this, you know, peated whiskey. I I just thought that it was a a decent palate. The sweet corn came through. There was some that cherry coming through. It was kind of like a really grainy rye, mm-hmm. and there was almost a little bit of like a orange juice, citrusy feel to it. But overall, it was just very grainy with a a, a little bit of sweet tacked on there. Yeah, this reminds me of some of the whiskeys that are blended with like neutral grain spirits, like a Seagram 7. Like it almost has that uh, unflavored alcohol with a tinge of whiskey flavor to it. Mm -hmm. Um, I will say this. This whiskey is even more expensive than the Westland was. This is retailing for $199 a bottle. It is a very cool looking bottle. It is endorsed by a celebrity. So they're clearly targeting the premium market here. And Brad, it's not saying nothing that we're using an eight-year-old bourbon, a seven-year-old bourbon, and a 20-year-old Canadian rye. So I expect this to be triple digits. I just, I think even then, asking $200 for this is asking quite a bit. Yeah, I I would say that uh, asking $100 for this is way too much, Bob. Mm. That Like for me, this is like a $50 whiskey. Yeah. It, if that, uh, no, I, this is like a $50 whiskey. It's solid. It is a, it's a unique experience. It's just a little bit too grainy and too ethanol forward for me to ever say, spend more than $50 on this. I just took a third sip. I think the malt really starts to come out on the end on the third sip. But again, I think I always say that if it takes you three or four sips to start picking things up on a whiskey, then it probably just isn't the most complex whiskey. So I didn't mean for these two to go head to head today, but it's just the way things shake out sometimes when we get samples sent to us, we got to double up to get through them all. And I think the clear winner today was this Westland Solum. This stuff, Brad, is going to be making my end of the season best whiskeys I tried all season list. This is fantastic stuff, man. A hundred percent. And I'm thankful that Gypsy sent us their product. I I will say it came in one of the coolest product uh, delivery systems <laughs> I've ever seen. Yeah, why don't you explain that a little bit before we get out of here? Yeah, no, the, they sent me a book that was like completely full and it had a cutout in it that you received the sample in. And it was one of the dopest uh, whiskey things I've ever seen. Big, big fan of the the, the uh, prohibition yeah. level packaging. <laughs> I'm just sad that we didn't do this 
paired up with Shawshank Redemption. Like this would have been mm, the perfect yeah. carving something out of a book to smuggle something in. Yep. Really, really cool packaging. Yeah. So thank <laughs> you to both of these companies. Thank you to Westland. Thank you to Whiskey Gypsy. We're looking forward to seeing what both of you guys do in the future. Brad, in our near future, we are pivoting out of Catherine Bigelow territory and throwing it way back to the silent era as we kick things off on Tuesday with the first movie from Charlie Chaplin on our list, 1931's City Lights. Yeah, super excited for that, Bob. I have never, fun fact, watched a silent film. Well, you will now, Brad, because it's finally (laughs) time. So join us Tuesday for that. But until then, I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And we'll see you next time. 